Battle Line podcast, uh, for the new people listening who might be checking this out because of the fact that uh, this the uh, Bastards Road movie is so big for the first time, my name is Ian Scotto. My name is Tonto. Yeah, that's it. And, just uh, that's it. No other name. That's that's all. <laughs> Tonto Chris Barato. It's just and, Tonto. Uh, <laughs> yeah, every week on this show we interview different guys, whether it's from the special operations community. Although we've had more conventional military guys on lately, um, you know, like Jonathan yeah. Hancock. We've had I'm not going to lie, a lot of Marines lately, but there's just a lot of Marines doing a lot of cool shit. No, it's not. Hey, it's it's all the same. It's brotherhood's brotherhood, man. So, uh, uh, yeah, I had no issues at all with with having Marines on, and we like to hear them. And you know, they eat crayons and all that other all that other stereotypical stuff that's actually true. So we enjoy having the Marines on. They're they're always entertaining, and you know, you know, God bless them. They they went through a lot, especially during uh, you know global war on terror they, they were they were Fallujah and Ramadi big big pushes in both those places and which we'll talk we'll talk a lot today to, to Mr. Hancock we'll talk to him about that today yeah well we'll definitely get into all that um, but before we do you hear us very often talk about Ned and what full spectrum hemp has done for us and is doing for veterans really across across the country and across the globe I'm hearing so many positive things because of the fact that Yes, it's something that's going to get you a good night's sleep. It's something that's going to calm your nerves, and it's not addictive. So whenever I do hear, honestly, veterans that I know from this show or outside this show talk about that they're having issues with post-traumatic stuff, they're having issues with you know transitioning to a regular lifestyle after coming back from being deployed, I speak very highly of CBD, and the best CBD out there is NED because it's clean and it's pure and it's third-party tested. Yeah, great stuff, guys. I actually had a had a little bit of an issue after my Tennessee course with uh, you know, because I, I trained with body armor on, and then I went for a run on Monday, and I pushed it a little bit too hard for my fifty year old body, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you know, my back, my back kind of went out. So, uh, uh, and I I got a hold of the the body butter and and rubbed it on there, and it loosened it up. You know, the the pain and the, the ache went away, and because of all that, I was able to stretch it out and pop it back in or get it readjusted back in myself. And then I also have one of those hanging things where, the, where you look like a bat. But bottom line is, it, the stuff works. Um, I still believe in it. I, I you know whether it's the CBD oil that I use to help me sleep at night if I need it now, which is which has been tremendous and just getting my mind and emotions right to the the body butter who I that I just recently used just a couple of days ago. And now I'm back at 100%, went running. And, and then I also did rode the bike for an hour uh, after running and, and my back's fine. So uh, guys, you, you, you got to check it out. If you're an athlete or you just are very active, get the body butter. And of course, for your emotional wellness, the, the CBD oil is tremendous. And it did help me sleep and it still does when I need it. But I'm in a great place now that I don't need to use it all the time. But that says a lot for Ned because it helped me get where I needed to be over a year of taking it. And uh, every night, and I'm, I'm back to my old self. Tremendous stuff, guys. And Ned is a tremendous company. Yeah, and if you're looking for something just focused on sleep, they also have their Sleep Blend, which is also a full spectrum hemp product. Um, so you could check that out. But yeah, whenever whenever I take that full spectrum hemp and I go to sleep, I do remember my dreams vividly. I usually don't remember my dreams, and yet I wake up refreshed. It's not like taking a sleeping pill or something where you wake up all groggy and you can't get the day started. Like yeah. I'm I'm ready to seize the day. So if you haven't tried it yet, guys, you got to get on board. And if you want to check out Ned and any of their full spectrum hemp products for yourself, we have a special offer for the Battleline audience. Go to Hello Ned dot com slash battle line or enter battle line at checkout for 15 percent off your first one-time order or 20 percent off your first subscription order plus free shipping that's h-e-l-l-o-n-e-d dot com slash battle line to get 15 percent off your first one-time order or 20 percent off your first subscription order plus free shipping thank you ned check it out guys once again it's hello ned dot com slash battle line with that let's get right into everything from omaha nebraska to new york city 
From Planet Earth to Extraterrestrial Life in Space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Twitch is on. Motherfucker, I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dead for a long time. <laughs> you are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. The Switch is on, Battle Line Podcast. Really excited to talk to Jonathan Hancock this episode. Uh, and you're going to hear that, you know, if you haven't seen it already, I know a lot of you have, Bastard's Road really is a tremendous documentary that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I enjoyed the documentary necessary cause it, necessarily because it's it's a hard watch. You know, it's not necessarily an enjoyable film, It's yeah. um, but it's a real film. And it's not a Hollywood production. It is marines who served who lost guys either deployed or um lost guys to suicide unfortunately and this is their real story with their real emotions yeah, um and uh, for, for veterans it's 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 powerful and and it is it's the beginning of a healing process i watched it and it's it was it was like where i was at back in the beginning and seeing now where i'm at it's it's honestly it's nice kind of to look back for me and and say well that was we all had our journey. He actually physically did a long walk, but all of us did some sort of walk within our heads, within our lives, going in different directions, and then being able to figure it out and come back and be like, okay, I feel better now. And it's essentially what I did for three years. So it was, it's a great video if you're having issues, guys, of deployments, or if you're suffering through any sort of post-traumatic stress, great video to watch. But to me, that's just the beginning. When he, the movie ends, that's the beginning of your new life after deploying. And, but yeah, we'll talk about that with him. We'll get into it. But it was, it was really, really a well done, gritty documentary. Uh, For what sure. It was to me. I, I agree. Um, by the way, but while we're doing this, am I still fine? Because it says I'm in the red here. I'm, I'm, I sound fine. You're still fine. The, the, so, the sound's good. You're like Paul was last time where, where his, his screen was all glitchy. But okay. your, your voice is fine. It's just, yeah, we'll, it's just we'll the screen's buffering, but your voice is. All right. Um, but no, you know what I'm interested to see is how Jonathan is now, because it takes time to really film a documentary, get the thing out there. So I'm sure it's been years since um, they actually shot the film. So he might be in a totally different place. I don't know. Uh, and, yeah. and I'm excited to see. And that actually brings me to another subject is that you worked on a documentary, a pilot uh, for a show. Mm. And at this point, it's probably been what four years. Four years, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think that just shows like how that. long it takes in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, and, four, and four now, years, brother. This, yeah, this thing is finally gonna see the light of day on Newsmax because at the point at um, a while back, the only way you would have possibly have seen this is if you were at the premiere. Um, so now people are finally mm -hmm. gonna get a chance to see it this summer. Yeah, with with the uh, with Ryan Deltz's family, uh, which was, uh, you know, it was it was that was therapeutic for me. That was like part of my long journey back of of getting my head right because I, I I wasn't always even during that filming I wasn't in a great place in my own head going through a lot of adversity and just dealing with what went on in the years of me being gone. Uh, but you know, talking to Mrs. Deltz, talking to Cheryl Deltz, Ryan's mom. And I've said it on the show before, I may not have referred directly to to Cheryl, to Mrs. Dolt, but talking to her and seeing how she overcame what she went through when her son passed away and then Newsweek had it on their, I mean, that was terrible, but that's the media for you. And how and she accepted it, how she moved on and now is is very, very positive person when she had every right to be angry at everyone, to me was, it was a wake up call for me like, hey, Tana, quit being a big puss. Look how tough this lady is, this gold star mom. And you're whining about everything. Be like, be like Cheryl, which is what it was. And and so it, it not only is the video great, and you're gonna see some, and it, it it's a pilot, so there's stuff we need to work out on. I thought it did very was very well done though by by uh, Jack over there that did it. But um watch Cheryl and to see how she has 
stay, remain positive when she had every right to not be positive. And also the amazing story of Ryan and his trials and tribulations as well uh, before his passing there in, in Iraq. Um, it's tremendous. It was, and it was very therapeutic for me. It was where I needed to be at that moment in time. God works in mysterious ways, brother. He does. He just puts you in pass. So um, the video was great, but being on set and talking to Cheryl Dolce is something that I needed to do at that point in time to help me in my life. Just everybody's going to see it publicly, which that's kind of weird, but Hey, that's, that's, that's the lifestyle of, of I'm in now. So this is how it is. Uh, I'm curious because I'm not familiar at all. What did Newsweek do that you're referring to? They actually had a reporter on site when, uh, and a photographer that was embedded with Ryan's unit when he hit was hit, and they took pictures of him, his dead body being pulled out of his Bradley that was hit. They were pulled out, and they, and they put it on before even consulting the family. They put it out there. So the first time Cheryl, Mrs. Dolt, saw Ryan after the attack, his dead body was in a magazine, and that was, and things did change, I believe, after that, but that was irresponsible reporting, you know, before we got to be the first ones out there. I got pictures of a dead U S soldier. Let's get it out in the magazine. Ryan's not even in Arlington cemetery yet. Cheryl doesn't even know what's going on. And all of a sudden her son brings it and says, Hey mom, look at this. And it's, it's already Newsweek magazine. There's Ryan dead's body picture taken. And, uh, you know, Cheryl goes in and talks about it and discusses it and discusses what happened after and the phone call she made to Newsweek, which is what was really awesome to me is I did not see one even flicker of anger in her eye when she did. She really felt sorry for the reporter or anything like, hey, you know, because it, it was a young kid looking to looking to move up in the ranks. And you know how the media is, you know, media is terrible. It was even worse back then because they had even less rules and less worries or less, uh, you know, views on, lesser views on, on how to handle themselves with morality over there being embedded with U.S. troops. And uh, I, ne I never believe that, that importers, uh, reporters should be embedded with any troops. Uh, that's one of the reasons right there. But um, yeah, that, that was part of what War Heroes was about when with the documentaries, we talk about that. Because that was a huge turning point in the Dolce's family's, family's lives is could they have gone off the rails and just hated everybody for the rest of their lives because of what happened? And then because of the, the, the United States media putting that out there without even consulting them? Or could they turn it around and become a positive family and a positive voice for those other Gold Star families, which is what they went that they went that route. And that was amazing to me. That showed so much strength. And it just shows how strong mothers are with, you know, that have their sons and daughters that are serving and deploying that, that, and then have passed away. It shows their strength. And it reminded me how strong my mom was. I, I, you know, you know, you take it for granted, but I know my mom worried every day that I was gone for how many years, 18 years that I was either training or deployed, putting her through <laughs> living hell. Um, so, you know, it was, it was remarkable how strong, mothers and family are and and of, and then we talked to his sister as well she's tremendous uh we uh her, his brothers interview in there and some of his old army buddies that were part of his unit um and, and then also went to the uh military academy with with him um and uh yeah brother it, it, it's it was it was it was great for me but i think the the end product is great too and hopefully the pilot gets picked up so we can do future episodes talking to other gold star family members and you know, because people well, need to is see that, that the plan because I mean, we, we the, see. I, I'm just wondering, is that the plan? Because the, the pilot itself we know is airing on Newsmax, not to be confused with Newsweek, since we're talking about Newsweek. Newsmax, yeah. So, is the plan to have more episodes? Yes, that the pilot, if it gets picked up, then it'll be, uh, and I don't know if it'll be weekly. That's up to Jack you, Thomas Smith, it is the, picked the up, uh, though, right? director, it, but isn't it picked up at this point? The pit, the pop, the the pilot is picked up. How it works is the pilot gets picked up. They're going to show it. And then if it does well, then they'll request future episodes. So that's how it's working with this one so far with Newsmax. And, and this is, this is, I'm getting third party information guys. I'm just the ugly face on there. Jack, but Jack did call me and tell me, Hey, we got it picked up. Finally. I'm like, yeah, all right. That sounds great. I'm, I'm happy for Jack because he is a, he really loves the and, military. And who's never Jack? Served. Because I think this audience, he, when they hear Jack, they he's, think he's, like Jack Silver, Jack Murphy. Jack, 
No, no. Jack Thomas Smith is the producer and the director. He's the one behind this. His is the brains and this is his vision. And then he's also the director and the filmmaker of these, of hopefully future docu-series stuff. But this is the first one. Jack's, Jack's the power behind the throne. He's the one that's running the show and the run out, one out there that's been pitching it. And he, you know, he has a, a very long career in Hollywood. So he knows the deal that things don't get picked up right away. That's why he just continued to put it out in front of people. So, um, but that is the plan, future series about uh, and speaking to uh, Gold Star family members, because that is something we don't see. You know, you see a series right now where we're talking to fellow Marines and generally that's what it is. It's you're talking to other Marines, you're talking to other Rangers, you're talking to other guys that served that are never really a focus on the family. And I think that's where it's different is the focus is, yeah, we're, we're you know, this is what happened to their son or daughter, but the focus is on the family. How are you handling it? Because that is where strength to me comes from, is, is the family. How is the family getting through it? I mean, you know, God bless those that have, that have lost their lives. But, you know, I've seen it with Pat and Cheryl Smith, with Pat uh, Smith. You know, we had her on the show with Sean's, Sean's mom, Cheryl Bennett, who was Ty's mom, you know, with the, with uh, Katie Quigley, who's Bub's, Bub's sister. You know, they're here still and they still have to remember it and they still have to go through stuff that they see, whether they listen to this podcast and hear me talking about it or they hear something negative on the, they're still here having to, to, to deal with the loss, but how do they do it? And every one of them that I've talked to has been positive. And I think everybody can get something out of that, get something that there's positivity left and there's still people that remain positive and family is the hugest thing that gets you through it all is, is the strength of your family. And, and that was important. That's why I signed on for it. If it was going to be like just another, not that they're bad, but another, let's talk about soldiers. Let's go talk about, you know, hey, let's focus on the soldier here and not focus on the family. Probably wouldn't have done it. I just felt like this is where it needed to be. And my family is the one that's helped me get out, got out of my funk. It wasn't, it was my brothers and sisters that I served with. Sure, they helped. But when I went, came down to it, it was my family that pulled me out of, of the, the depths of hell that I'd put myself in. So, uh, yeah, brother. So I, I hope I, you know, yeah, it got picked up for the pilot, but this one, it wasn't a guaranteed, Hey, a pilot in five episodes, it's a pilot. They have to see how well it does. If it does well, you know, and you get your Nielsen ratings up there where it needs to be, then they'll request however many future, but that's above my pay grade. That's Jack Thomas Smith. I'm just here. Jack, tell me where you need to be. I'll smile, put a lot of makeup on though. Cause it's been four years and I got a lot more wrinkles since then. So, um, but um, I, I love doing it. I think it's going to be very, it's very good for me because I, I love talking to family members and seeing their strength. And it reminds me how big of a pussy I am <laughs> when I talk to them. It's like, man, I, I can be a hell of a lot stronger. Look at these people. They're fucking tremendous. And uh, yeah, Cheryl, Cheryl Dulce is amazing. We got to get, we, actually, there's another one we need to get on the show. It'd be tremendous to have her on the show. She's, she's a school teacher still, still in New Jersey. Um, just straight up New Jersey hardcore mother. That would be awesome to have on the show because she she tells it like it is. But she you can just tell she's got that sweetness around that she's going to tell you like it is, and she's going to invite you in and bite chocolate chip cookies for you. That's the kind of woman. Well, she is. it would it would probably so, make um, sense to have her on once this airs, and you know we don't have a date right now, but be on the lookout. We'll let you know when it yeah. does. I mean, I think it'll do well because. Look, regardless of uh, if people love the channel, aren't into the channel, I know Newsmax is doing great in ratings. So I would hope some <laughs> yeah, of that yeah. goes over to what you guys are doing. And and I know it's a positive film, even though I have yet to see it, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, but anyway, we do have to get to Jonathan Hancock. So before we do, you hear us every show talk about Fort Scott Munitions, which is the best ammo on the market. Fort Scott is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact. That's their trademark in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammo was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. And it was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring they receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Now, if you go to the store locator, the uh, dealer locator on the website, you're going to find a dealer by you that sells Fort Scott. So go to fortscottmunitions.com, 
And you're going to see something in all 50 states. Just go there. Um, you know, for me on Long Island, the closest uh, place that sells sports, Scott, is South Shore Sportsman in Merrick. So chances are you're going to find something right by you. And then they also have their merch. They have great hats, great T-shirts. Just go to that same website, fortscottmunitions.com. Enter the promo code BATTLELINE, and you're going to get 15% off at checkout. And I know you've been doing a lot of classes lately. You have a lot more on the horizon. Yeah. And you are utilizing Fort Scott Munitions. Yeah. They provide you your ammo. Yeah, we just had a course at Tread Proof Training. Good good little stress fire. It was raining, and it was muggy and hot and muddy. And we're running around, uh, running around the range, and, and that stuff – just worked like a champ. I, it is tremendous ammo, guys. Very accurate, very powerful. Um, and again, then of course the company itself, a lot of integrity with Robbie Forrester over there and Ryan Craft. So uh, guys, check them out. And then they have great merch too. I, Ian and yep. I still digging, yep. digging the shirts, the, the Fort Scott shirts that they have and the t-shirts. And uh, so definitely check them out, guys. Great ammo, great merch, great company. And, and uh, yeah, you can't go wrong with Fort Scott Munitions. Hell yeah. So FortScottMunitions.com. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, Battleline Tactical, and the Battleline Podcast. All of that info is in the description for this episode, so check it out. Joining us on the podcast is Jonathan Hancock, the main person really featured in the film Bastards Road, directed by Brian Morris, written by Mark Stafford. And I have to mention music by Jeremy S.H. Griffith because the music itself I thought was amazing. I mean, I'm a music guy, but I really felt he did an incredible job. And in terms of like the drone shots in the film were great. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have you on first and foremost. Well, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, man. It's uh, I'm, I'm glad that the film's getting out there as much as it is. And I'm glad you guys could uh, take some time. We could just chat. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, it was, it's an honor, man, to, to have have you here. And, and uh, you know, I, I saw the film. I, you know, I, I know the unit, I, you know, that you're with. Um, I didn't know yet was you were with him. But I, I know the just for me being around that there at that time as well. And, you know, yeah. being in the meat grinder is essentially what it is. With, with yeah, you. I mean, it really, really was. But yeah, you know, if you could, and, and you know, always, we get a lot of youngsters that listen. I always say this, and people that want to join the service and want to go in, you know, um, give them your story. Because a lot of people don't know your story or the unit, or they they may not know the unit itself unless you really were serving in the Global War on Terror at that time. And you were near the Triangle. Um, you know, talk to them about it if you can, brother. And I get it. You yeah, know, yeah. If you can't, but but I, I I want people to know your story and and know that know your know your brothers and and then we can get into the movie because I think it ties into really well to, to the movie and then the post traumatic stress. I don't call, I don't put a D at the end. I don't think it, yeah. that disorder. That's bullshit. But um, yeah, brother. Yeah, this is this is your platform, man. Run I, with it. I dig it, man. So yeah, I was a Navy brat, right? Born in Honolulu, and then uh, Dad was in the submarine force, and uh, we moved all over the world. I'm in, I'm in Upper Rice Lip in a commissary in England and like, I don't know, I'm probably seven years old and I see this mountain of a man behind me uh, and he's just got, you know, he's got his camouflage fatigues on, he's got the dual cooler, so he's got his jump and his scuba and uh, I was like, I, I looked at him, I looked at my dad and I was like, who is that? And he goes, that's a force reconnaissance marine, they're the most badass things on the planet and I was like, well, that's what I want to be then. Yeah, you're that, that young? And you're yeah, man. Holy yeah, dude. Shit. That was one of my first memories, man. Well, my first memory is, of course, like watching Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. But then after that, you know, close to short order, I'm like, holy shit, all of a sudden, like I'm looking at this Marine and I really want to do that. So I, you know, I head into high school uh, in Maryland. We, I call Maryland my home because I did all four years of high school there. Uh, but side note, they hate veterans and they hate guns. So I left. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? Oh, I'm, that's just how it, that's just how it is there on the East Coast. Um, not all places, though, right? Right, Ian? No, no. no I, I will say, like here on Long Island, that I think is very friendly towards vets. I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, man. So I uh, I got into high school, and I was like ninth grade. The Marines are in the cafeteria, and I was like, I'm going to be a Marine. Let's do it right now. I'm going to join today. And they're like, All right, slow down there, spark plug. Like, graduate high school first, you idiot. And <laughs> so of course, I'm like, All right, maybe I'll do that. So, but yeah, I, I mean, I walked off, I walked off the stage and then hell a week and a half later, I'm on the yellow footprint wow. and, wow. uh, you know, I graduated September 7th of 2001, man, four days later, the wow. world changes. and yeah. uh, Holy you know, all of a yeah. sudden I realized that, and it's kind of a funny little anecdote, right? So on the morning of September 11th, 
uh, th that ticker is going across, says, if you're active duty military, call this number right now. So I called this number and I was like, oh, you know, private first class Hancock reporting for duty. And, uh, <laughs> and she goes, yeah, right on. What, what unit are you in? And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to SOI. And she just fucking hung up on me. She was like, oh, I've got time for this shit. Come on, fire, fireball. Go, go get your training first. Before, get, get the, uh, cool. right. like, she's just right. cool wasting my time, man. Get yeah, man. <laughs> So, but yeah, that's <laughs> so then I went I went through school infantry in Lejeune and then uh, chopped right over to the Victor unit, chopped right over to 2-4. Well, uh, we can't knock you for your motivation, man. You're a definitely motivated motherfucker since you were seven years old. I yeah, just brother, straight up, it man. Was, yeah. Yeah, it, was the, uh, it was absolutely the choice I wanted to do. And wow. uh, so, you know, I'm okay. So I chopped to 2-4, realizing that I'm now in 5th Marine Regiment, the most highly decorated combat regiment mm -hmm. in, on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, yeah. I realized I was honing in with the big boys and, you know, we went to, we went to Okinawa in, uh, bef like during OIF one, OIF one happened. We were actually in Korea, uh, when the cruise missiles went off the boat on March 19th. Okay. And then, uh, you know, so we're stuck out there. Two, four gets this moniker two, four, no war. Right. Cause the rest of the fifth Marine regiment is task force terror. They're pushing up into Baghdad and we're missing out. And uh, it was, man, it was hard for us. So we got stop lost for a, a year uh, and we were wow. stuck on the rock and Oki for a year. So we were just circling the South Pacific, man, just doing that wow. number on the Gators and uh, just doing a lot of bilat training and all that, all that shit that goes down. But man, we were watching the war from, from a, a little, you know, four inch TV on a ship and wow. uh, that really hurt us. And so of course, every dude in two, four was just praying to get into this gunfight and, you know, we wanted to, we wanted it. And then, you know, we get back in July, I think, of 2003. Uh, you know, everything's kind of really subsided. Baghdad's been taken. You know, the army's in. Everybody's kind of where they're going to be. Now let's start working on, like, these conventional deployments that are going to come up, right? And so, of course, we go into Ramadi in February of 2004. And every 2-4 guy that, you know, begged for war, man, we got yeah. exactly what we asked for. And yeah, then yeah. And, uh, yeah. it was it was rough, man. And so uh, we, Fox Company, actually, the company I was part of, took the first casualty in uh, mid to late March of PFC Dang. And he got hit in the head with an RPG and it was it was a bad scene. And uh, right after that, we realized that this is not what we signed up for. It wasn't the Sasso mission. They had said, you know, it's like, oh, you're going stability and support operations. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, shit, like, I don't need to worry about this dude's infrastructure anymore. I got to worry about shooting these guys. Yeah. And uh, it got real tough real quick. And then April 6th was – so the Battle of Ramadi, right, is – of course, it's the entire deployment. But the real Battle of Ramadi is April 6th to April 10th. Okay. And on April 6th, we uh, – uh, Golf Company went out uh, from, their, uh, from their FOB, and almost immediately they were ambushed. And uh, within the blink of an eye, seven guys are gone. And then uh, uh, right after that, Echo Company <clears throat> took a massive hit on the 7th. Uh, 11 more guys are gone. And I was – and combat's a lottery, right? So I was kind of weird in this weird way because Fox Company didn't see nearly as much combat as Echo Golf did. And then, of course, Weapons Company because they're just out in the thick of it in a different fob. And we're, we're kind of over in like the Bath Party Generals area, okay. if you will, the higher echelon. So, but for some reason, my squad, Raider 3-2, was in every gunfight they were in. We were just, it just happened to be in those areas. And on April 7th, uh, a golf company squad got pinned down. There was no maneuver elements around. And we, we abandoned our post and ran to them uh, and decided, okay, hey, we're in the thick of it. And we got to help these guys out. Uh, of course, you know, our commanding officer is like, no, you're not going. You have to maintain this post. And we said, nah, screw that. We're not yeah. doing that even a little bit. We'll come back and take the post back if we have to, but our brothers are hurt and there's guys that need medevacs. We got to go help sure. them. And so, you know, after April 10, you know, we had had a pretty big black eye on the 6th and the 7th. And then after April 10, you know, we're just, we're running through the streets with megaphones, just begging these guys to come out and fight. And they don't want to go toe to toe with us. They wanted yeah. all these little sneak attack bullshits because they can't fight like us. And so then from then on, it was a lot of ambushes. There's a lot of little sporadic gunfights uh, I can count more days of not uh, of gunfighting than not gunfighting. And so we came back. 
I want to say it was like, well, September 12th was the last day of engagement. And then we flew okay. home, you know, through the customs process and that nonsense. Uh, got home. And then I, uh, I, was, I was running through uh, laundry one day. And back on the 7th, some dude shows up. We're pinned down. And he shows up in an up-armored SUV, right? And he comes out with beard, long hair. He's got this really little gun. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, that, that's badass. Who, who the fuck is that guy? Uh, yeah. and so he's like, Hey, there's like three guys in this building. There's two guys in this building. And then there's like, there's an ambush set up for you down this way. And then he gets his car. He just drives off. And I'm like, well, who the fuck was that? Yeah, that's, that's a unit, unit guy or SAD guy. One right. Of the two. Yeah. Sucked, yeah. Right. And then, so all of a sudden <laughs> I'm, so I'm driving and, or we're, we're driving through the city and we're, we're, he's, we're nailing it. Like he's nailing this shit on the head. And I'm like, man, those guys, like that guy was right. So at the end of the day, I see him. And uh, he's sitting by a, a fire barrel smoking a cigar. And I told my squad, I was like, hey, guys, I'll get you back to we'll get back to our base here in a little while. I got to go talk to this dude. So I walked over and I was like, all right, man, who are you and how do I get your job? And he goes, <laughs> uh, would you believe it if I said I was a Marine? And I'd be like, no fucking way, dude. And uh, he shows me his ID card. And I'm like, all right, now, how do I really get your job? Yeah, yeah. And uh because now it's really possible because I don't – like something in the Marine Corps, I can just go do that. And so I got home. He gave me his number. He said, if you make it through this deployment alive, call this number. I made it home. was doing some laundry in the barracks uh, that night, and this number pops out of this fucking pocket I had. And I was like, I got to call that guy. So I called the dude, and uh, next thing you know, I laterally moved and went through school down on Damn Neck and uh, became a counterintelligence human intelligence specialist. Awesome. Uh, now, were you, were you still in or did you have to get out and contract? Were you oh, no, no, no. I was still in. So, I yeah, That's I laterally cool. moved. And That's awesome. US and, okay. Yeah, man. So I did that and then uh, did another uh, six deployments uh, supporting everyone, uh, mostly in the tier one sectors, uh, and then supporting them uh, through different operations and different deployments. And then I got out. September 21st of 2009 and was already two weeks late for University of Maryland. I mean, I was still, I was still running a gun and, and kids are like showing up to class on the first day. And I'm like, Hey guys, I, I think I'll be there. I hope I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, and you kind of oh, get yeah, into man. that in the film, um, you know, and, and the film has, you know, cause this kind of ties into what Chris was asking about kids who want to join, who want to hear the positives and the negative. The film really has this dichotomy of like, you have this, absolute love of your Marine Corps brothers. They're the most important people in your life. And then at the same point in the film, you're very candid where you have moments where you say, fuck the military, fuck the Marine Corps. I wish I never would have done yeah. this. So like, yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, how do you feel now? If, if your kid who you have a great relationship with, you said, I want to join right. the Marine Corps, how would you feel? You know, it that's his choice, man. And uh, that was a journey for me. Uh, that journey of getting out of the Marine Corps, deciding that I hated it, deciding that it destroyed me, then to realize that it didn't destroy me and that it was actually the thing that saved me and that I had to just hearken back to the principles that I used during combat and, and that were instilled in me in boot camp and throughout my Marine Corps sure. career that really, really were the things that said, OK, no, it's not the Marine Corps fault, homie. It's your fault. And that was my big realization. And so, yeah, but the you know, I. If I was going to tell anybody anything that wanted to go into the military, it's go into it with an open heart uh, and realize that you probably can't judge the Marine Corps or the service off of just four years. You got to do a little bit more than that to really get into it and see what it is. Because your first four years, man, I mean, maybe you make E4, maybe E5, maybe, um, but you really don't get uh, – you really don't get the experience uh, of, of being in that and then providing the leadership that you were taught in your previous uh, previous enlistment. So I think it's paramount that if you decide to do this, uh, you don't listen to the ones around you. They're like, I'm doing my four and getting out and going to college. Like, If you really want to do this, do it. Absolutely. But whatever you do, go into it 100 percent and never quit on it and never give yourself the excuse that it's the military's fault. I agree. Uh, it, it never I, my, it's never the military's fault. If, if I was anything pissed off when I came back myself, it was I, it was that I actually believed politicians. And then I finally realized, wait a second. Ah, fucking A. I got, OK, you fooled me. You got yeah. me. I, right. I, and that was being pissed off. But then realizing, wait a second, who got fooled? I, I'm the one that let him fool me. And I kept going over and I kept doing what I was doing. It wasn't 
hey, I got to take responsibility for what happened. And but then bottom line is I, I enjoyed it. And the there are times that were amazing. And where are you going to see like the stuff you saw, whether it's good or bad, you know, and the 203 were, hey, I, I, little girl died on me in Baghdad. I got it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I get it. Um, yeah. And you listen to that 203 story reminded me of that. But yeah. I didn't get the bad feeling that I used to get thinking like, God damn, I fucked up. It was, man, that's an experience. Yes, it sucked. But, you know, I realized war is hell. That's just how it is. But God dang, that's an experience. Who who can sit on their porch when they're 90 and go, fucking hey, I really have nothing that I need to go experience. Yeah, there's some stuff I didn't do. I didn't go, you know, I didn't go to some some cave in Spain to go spelunking. But God dang, I right. did a lot of stuff and saw a lot of shit. And that, I, I'm able to do that now. And I'm watching your story was like that, brother. It's just watching that journey that I think we all go through. Not, not, and yours is actually literally walking a journey where guys, since that's what I saw, it's a journey that we all go through. Some guys walk it, you walk 600 miles, you force dumped it. Hey, that's fucking great, dude. <laughs> Knock it out. Right. But every one of us goes through some journey like that. And, and we either come to a realization that it's okay, dude. We fucking did remarkable stuff. Don't be pissed off and take responsibility for what we did. Nobody forced us to go sign up. Nobody pointed a right. gun to our heads. But then think back and go, man. And that's why you're walking off at the end of it. Like, man, like it's like walking off in the sunset. Yeah. I won, man. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. And I was I was talking to somebody the other day on an interview, and I was like, dude, it's about winning. It's about it's about putting yourself back into the position of actually having a win in your win yeah. column again. Yeah. And yeah. You know, for a long time, I didn't have a win. I didn't have a, a check mark in my win column, dude. I'd quit everything I tried after the Marine Corps. I quit college. I quit relationships. I quit fucking jobs. I just quit it all. Anytime it got hard, I quit it because I was like, you don't understand what I'm going through, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then I'm realizing, I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I could be doing right now. And, you know, unfortunately, that culminated with, you know, two DUIs and a suicide attempt, sure. man, that lands sure. me in a Baltimore VA hospital. And that was a tough run for me. That was rock bottom because now I'm handcuffed to a bed and yeah. I'm looking at my mother and father. I got tubes and nodes and shit everywhere. And, you know, I got to go away for, for five days in this psych ward. Yeah. And man, that's when the inspiration kicked in. And I saw this dude named Mike Vitti. He was an army cat and uh, he started something called Legacies Alive. Mm -hmm. And man, he walked one kilometer for each person that's been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan since the 01 kickoff. Wow. And I was like, I got to do it. I got to go meet with my boys. I got to go talk to them. Hey, knock it off. <laughs> oh, I can't even. <laughs> He's a big idiot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Yeah, so I just I decided right there. I was like, I got to go do this, and I didn't know how because I'm 308 pounds. I'd been eating and drinking my feelings wow. since I got out. You got that? You got yeah. that? Holy crap! Wow. Yeah, brother, okay. it was. He didn't look it though. That's why I think you're kind of shocked. Like in the movie, I wouldn't have thought you were 308. I mean, pounds. You, you look like you look like a fucking linebacker, but you don't look like yeah, great. You, you you could hold 308. Right. Like where the fuck did you hold 308? Jesus, I, it, all over, man. It was just a big gelatinous mess of alcohol and food. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it was just one big force field all around me. <laughs> That's you know what I'm just, is, dude, is, you, uh, you call job of the hut. They got the call sign for you, bro. It's Jabba. Got it. It's, we're up. going with Jabba. That was working. It. Okay. Up. Call sign Jabba. I'll take it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Star Wars um, nerd anyway. <laughs> Like, uh, like, yeah, that's because you said that earlier. Um, but when Chris was saying that this was almost like the beginning of a journey for you, it felt like watching the movie uh, along with an actual physical journey of walking 6,000 miles. I assume, I mean, I know a little bit of what goes into making the film. This must have been a few years ago at this point. Like, are you in a totally different place in your life than you were when that film oh. ended? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I the, the biggest thing that everyone always says that's kind of like, man, I wish – like they have one critique and the critique is like, what are you doing now? Um, because, you know, we see this entire thing, but then it just kind of ends. And yeah. so it's kind of been on me to kind of educate people on what went on. And so yeah. I really took this as my second chance deployment, right? Like, let's do this all over again. Let's go deploy across the United States this time. And now when you come home, you get a second chance to do this all over again. And I never wanted to get old me to get the best of me. So I decided, I was like, I'm gonna go back to school. So I went back to uh, uh, Thunderbird University or awesome. Thunderbird uh, Global School of Management and I graduated 
uh, December 17th of 2019. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so I graduated from the number one business school in the nation, man. And I couldn't be more proud. And then, you know, in the meantime, during that. Uh, By the way, that that's time, good I'm timing because you got to get out before the whole COVID hit and you'd have to be doing this from home. Like you got the actual in-person right. experience. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, because COVID hit like three three months later. And I was like, yep, well, this, yep. well, this sucks. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a I'm a government contractor now. And I work down in uh, Sierra Vista and I, oh, uh, I'm. I'm teaching. Uh, I'm teaching a course down there. Sweet. Uh, some of the advanced guys. So that's pretty badass. And then uh, I got married to a woman I met out here. Uh, fell in love with her. We got married April seventeenth of this year. Uh, so we've been together almost four years now. And then uh, yeah, we're buying a house and things are going well, man. And I can tell you that uh, had I not done this walk and had I not really taken self accountability, I wouldn't be here today, man. Like even after the walk, and I just like tried to rest on that laurel. Yeah. I, it, it once you do something great, you got to do something great again. And me realizing that I was helping so many of my brothers while helping myself, I realized that was my avenue going forward. And all I could do from here on out was just help my brothers and help any veteran that's struggling in any way I can. And, you know, the, the easiest way to do it is to let them watch the film. Uh, and then after that, you know, if you're really interested, come out with me on a hike because I've got a nonprofit called Bastards Road Project. And I take veterans out on long distance hikes, man. And uh, our tagline is walk long distances, figure some shit out. Because that's all I did. <laughs> and that's I love that's it. all we do, man. It's great. Uh, and that's you buy yourself out there. That's, that's why I still run. I run every day. Yeah. Running I, it, it keeps me in shape. But the biggest thing is I can get out there by myself. And my brain clears. My mind clears. And and I don't have to run fast. I can't run fast anymore. I'm too fucking old. I'm 50 years old. So, But I can still put in the miles. I still got the endurance to and it, bro, that is the most therapeutic thing is just being on your own, whether it's biking or hiking. Hiking is amazing, man. You're growing up in Colorado, it's being out there by yourself. Or if you if you don't mind pounding the pavement, getting out and running because it, it yeah. is it's more therapeutic. It's spiritual, man. It's spiritual is what the fuck it is. It, it yeah, really you're is. absolutely right, man. And, you know, I found I found a lot of spirituality on the walk and, you know, I, I don't know where I sit in, in my, my relationship with God or a God. I'm not sure where I sit with that, but I do know that every morning I would wake up and I'd talk to my boys that are, that are gone and I'd talk to them and be like, all right, boys, like today's going to be a rough day. I got another 30 miles to pound. Like I need your help. <laughs> Fucking get me through this one. <laughs> okay. I don't know about the 30 miles. Mine would have lasted a hell. I would have been maybe five miles every day. And we've just yeah. done it for 10 years. Yeah, that 30 miles. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, it, was, it was pretty rugged, man. And then when you, because, you know, I've had a couple people, especially my dad, and he goes, you walk farther than 5,807 miles. And I'm like, hey, man, listen, I, 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 put that, I put that damn number there because one, I could prove those numbers without having to show you that, oh, yeah, I got turned around here yeah. and I had to walk 90 miles back this way. So I didn't want to do any of that. So anytime some asshole fact checker comes down and goes, <laughs> you actually walk 6,900 miles, I'm going to be like, thanks for the math, homie. Thanks for the, appreciate that. <laughs> they always, always, always go up and not down. And you know somebody would. Somebody oh, that sure. sits on their ass and be like, he didn't walk that fucking far. Yep. Uh, I go, I, I, well, there you go. Good job thinking ahead. That's brilliant. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. Hey, uh, on, the, uh, on the walks and, and, and you're know, doing that, my question, and this is a simple question, when you're walking through, what is it? This is a range of dumb question. It's just simple. What are the, 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 where you walk through and like, what the fuck is this? What's the, what is the coolest place? And what is the, holy shit? Um, I'm hearing the sound from deliverance here playing out here. I'm yeah. kind of, uh, cause I was, when you're walking, cause you don't really plan, did you plan a route out or did you just walk in out? Everybody's out there going, Tano, you're an idiot, dude. Why are you, we're so in depth and now you're asking about the coolest and the stupidest places. Or no, the, no, no, the, no, no, that's the, those are the great questions. Those are the ones people want to know anyway. But, um, I didn't really plan the walk. I planned it kind of like, it was more like, Hey, where are you guys located? And then, you know, I'd call two or three people and then I was like, Hey, who's on the Eastern seaboard? And because I was already heading south, so I was like, I got all the way down to Miami, then I traced the Gulf into Texas, wow. then into Colorado, then Nebraska, then South Dakota, then Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Washington, then down the western seaboard. Wow. So this, this thing was just this nonsense. And uh, I, I, you know, I've seen so many crazy places. And uh, 
I, I would say that in my top two most gorgeous, most awesome, uh, one of them I, I really don't want to say because then every fucking person from California is going to try to move there. <laughs> uh, but uh, Sheridan, Wyoming uh, is at the oh. big, big Horn Mountains. And you've yeah. Been there, yeah, yeah. No, I, I've been there to do teach and I've been there to do speaking events. It's beautiful. Yeah. Actually, we met a few years ago at the uh, Halo event. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, and that, but, but it also depends on the time of year, though, too. I, I'm not right. going to Sheridan, Wyoming in January and February. I'm sorry, dude. I, I mean, I don't know. I yeah. kind of dig it, but I like snow. <laughs> but then the other place is just absolutely insanely gorgeous is, uh, is uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And yeah. I mean, you just get up through there into like Fourth of July plas Pass, and you're in the Black Mountains of the Rocky Mountains. I mean, it is, man, that's a whole nother experience. So that you went from Miami all the that's like the Panhandle of of yeah. Idaho. You went all the way to the Panhandle. It is it is beautiful. I mean, it, oh yeah. And and I I was married to a Mormon. My first wife was Mormon, so I can say this. But there's I, well, I can't. They're still going to get pissed off me anyway. But you didn't. They didn't try to convert you when you were there. No no missionaries, more missionaries. No. LDS showed up and like, hey, we need to convert you so you can do your walk into. Switzerland and spread uh, the uh, Book of Mormon. Nothing no, like I, that. I, I, I did learn about in, uh, in when I walked through Sundance. So I I came in uh, to Wyoming through Belfouche uh, and Sturgis and all that right there. And so, so you walked through Robert Redford Sundance, the the ski resort that area, right? Yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. I, that's where I learned how to ski. No, that's, yeah. it was teeny when I, I grew up in American Fork, Utah, and I that's where I learned that. That's that's gorgeous. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow. But I, I learned about uh, a very small group of people uh, called the Hooderites, and uh, so that was <laughs> that was real interesting because I'm hanging out with a with a veteran that I I've been introduced to back in South Dakota. He actually lives out near Sundance, so I'm I'm hanging out with him and uh, <laughs> go out to some bar to have a couple drinks and just talk. And uh, this guy walks in and he's dead serious and he's talking about me having sex with his daughter, and I'm like. <laughs> What? And then my, my buddy's like, hey, man, we got to go. And I was like, yeah, we have to. I'm intrigued at this proposal. I don't want yeah, to. You're like, you're like, wait a like, second. Can we, got, can we just stay a second? This guy's gave me an excellent proposal. I, <laughs> like, I want to hear the guy out. Like, we're not going to do it. But I want to I mean, hear the, then All of a sudden, he's like, I got to be in the room. You can't touch her. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh that is the, I, 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 I haven't heard that that word and since i was married to yeah, yeah. To, I, I granted my my, my ex-wife's family doesn't swing like that but that was always i didn't know what that was either like what the hell is a hooder at? and then they yeah. stopped it and like, then you learn about it and you're like oh so okay this is yeah this is now scary and yeah uh, they, like i, I don't, don't want to do this anymore i don't want to talk to you anymore the, you, this is now weird and, so he uh, was well he would at least given you could you've got a steer for it as well like if you would have thrown that in or maybe a, right yeah, maybe I can a dowry and do some things here. I, I just end, I just end the walk, and I'm living like near Utah. Yeah, <laughs> the walk. Our, we're done with the movie, dude. We're done. I'm going to live on this ranch farm with no electricity and with no electricity. Yet and, you're and, allowed to use computers. Also. That's it. But it makes it, and I'm going to have sex with my wife that I can't touch, and her father's in the room. But it's all good. That's dude, that's a story within itself. That is. You know, <laughs> well, I ran I ran into some I ran into a lot of weird shit, but uh, I think. I think, yeah, probably one of the weirdest things I ran into a, uh, I ran into something weirder than this. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. This is in Geyserville, California. Okay. There's a little place down there. Uh, it's a campground and it's called the Hobbit hut. And, uh, so I, you know, I, I stopped for the night and I'm like, all right, well, it's a campground. I'm in this really ritzy ass town with a, like, it's like four, uh, four or five wineries, and then that's it, right? And people are just coming in and out of there and whatever they're doing. And so I'm, I'm kind of like, all right, I'll call this number, and hey, do you have any space? And they're like, listen, we've got a convocation this weekend. You're more than welcome to come. And I'm like, convocation? That's a, that's okay, what the fuck are we doing here? And so I, I show up, and uh, it's, uh, it's a campground, and then it's got a communal uh, cafeteria thing, uh, there's a house, and then there's uh, 29 steps that go up a hill to a temple. And uh, so I, I go and I sit in to dinner, and she goes, oh, we're, we're confirming all the new priests and priestesses. 
for ISIS. And I'm like, for, for fucking ISIS? For what? Is that what the same ISIS we're talking about? Is that, Ar no. is that Archer ISIS? The, no, so it, like ISIS. But these, are, like, but these are white people, right? Which must make you be like, we're not. Boom. Very, like, very odd. And uh, yeah. then I realized that it's uh, the Egyptian god Isis and that it's, you know, it's 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 that. And I'm like, all right. So then I'm talking to the groundskeeper guy and he's like, yeah, we've got like we've got a whole new crop of priestesses and they're all strippers. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? So I, <laughs> I go, and I, I sit in on this dinner. And so I'm eating dinner with him. Dinner's fine. And all of a sudden, like 16 trays of little cups of Kool-Aid come out. And I'm like, no fucking way. Oh, wait. That's, holy shit. <laughs> that's Jim Jones. And, the, and the sweat and the, gym, the sweat oh. pants with the white sneakers. And it, yeah, yeah and holy shit. Oh. And it was weird. And everyone was wearing white. And I'm like, all right, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not drinking this Kool-Aid. Not no. even a little. <laughs> and uh, so they were like, hey, have some. And I was like, I'm good. No, no, not at all. <laughs> And uh, so then they're like, okay, everyone, let's go to the temple for the, for the ceremony. The ceremony's four fucking hours long. Oh, I wow. Have, I have one picture of this woman was dressed as Cleopatra. Uh, and she, uh, she's a very, very large woman. And she, uh, she, was, uh, she started the thing and she had these little like tambourine symbol things in her hands. And then she had this big olive branch. And she was just waving the olive branch up and down all around the room. And I took a picture of this, but my flash was on and immediate. And I'm sitting in the back of this temple and immediately everyone turns and just stares. <laughs> at me. And I'm like, uh, super sorry. I'll delete that. Uh, I didn't delete it. I have it somewhere. I'll have to find it. So it's the only picture of proof of this fucking thing <laughs> ever happened. And, uh, but it was this weird. It was this weird thing, and every one of these women would get up and they're like, "I profess my undying love to Isis," and then two other gods that they got to choose. And so I'm like, "Oh, this is odd." And then after this, <laughs> everyone goes to this hot tub. Well, there's like, um, there's probably it, you probably fit thirty people in this hot tub. I call it a pool, but it was a hot. <laughs> tub. Uh, so, so I'm I'm. I'm sitting in this pool and everyone starts getting naked. And then there's a lot of women that shouldn't be getting naked or getting <laughs> naked. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is very odd to me. And I don't know what to do here. Uh, so I went, I went back to my tent. Uh, I packed up and I left <laughs> that night and uh, they were like, yeah, we're going to do breakfast in the morning. And like one guy was like, if we make it to the morning and I'm like, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah. yeah. So then that's so I'm leaving and I'm leaving in the middle of the night. Well, I make this stupid uh, Facebook video or iPhone video and I meant to send it to uh, Brian, the guy, the filmmaker and a couple other people. Was this like a video like, hey, if you don't hear from me again, I died in this. Please come find my body at this tent. Right. 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 I not. called my mother and gave her a GPS pin. I was like, I'm right here. Like, I should be here in the next five hours. Like, if you don't hear from me, like they've come for me. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. But I sent it to the wrong people and I had sent it to the lady who gave me the room or the, the campsite. And she was not happy about what I was saying on the fucking internet. Did you say like, holy shit or something? Oh yeah. I was like, these people are absolutely out of control. They're drinking Kool-Aid. Everyone's naked. Like somebody's talking about like loving this God. And oh, it was very odd, man. But yeah, Chris, so I, I have to say thank you so much for asking this question because I figured that, you know, the coolest experience would I, I didn't think there would be anything remotely no, this I, crazy. I and wanted, it's like it's like you wish this could have been in the film, but it totally would not have fit the film. But it would have so. taken it, but but that's why because I, I I know that there's so, gotta be crazy story because you're going all you over the country. You weren't thinking anything and, remotely as crazy as this, though, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, I did I I thought the other story. I didn't know we had ISIS in the you know, we got ISIS in the US right. drinking Kool-Aid and having orgies in large pools that they call hot tubs. Yeah. No, I, I had no really, idea. Really weird, man. But yeah, so <laughs> That that one tops the list, and a uh, buddy of mine, I guess I was doing uh, last year, went to Tig's thing and uh, and and yeah. screened it. And uh, Eric Stone King stands up at the end. He goes, "Tell us about the sex cult." <laughs> <laughs> I no, I figured you would yeah you would have been married like three times over and oh, yeah. different different states because America is great. I love this country. 
but there's some crazy shit. And you know, and, and it's not the stuff you see on the news. That's 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 bad crazy. There's some like fun crazy like this. That's I mean, it, it can be dangerous, but it's a right. fuck. It, it's a I, I know you're you're in there going, what the fuck is going on? And an hour later as you're walking out, you're thinking, going, that was hilarious. Yes, I'm glad right. I'm gone. I, I'm safe. I'm alive. But holy shit, that was fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote that story down just to make sure because I'm, I'm trying to piece together this book that I'm writing, which is actually like the unabridged version of The Walk. Wow. Yeah, um, that'd be great. And so I'm, I'm really working on that. But I'm writing all the stories that didn't make it into the documentary. And that, there's some fucking doozies in there, man. <laughs> oh, I can't. Yeah, no, we, I can't. We, we got to have you back on when you when you get the book. Yeah, yeah for sure. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, it yeah. just would have been hard to fit this on here because honestly, it, it was a dark movie and it it had some you know humor moments of humor, you know, you singing Taylor Swift as you're walking and stuff like that. But overall, it was it was a darker movie because of the subject matter. And the thing that I really have to say, I appreciate you doing and and really um, commend you with is just your candidness, uh, like to an extent that I've never seen before. You know, in uh, Chris's book, for example, you talk about your shortcomings and your bad points. But the fact that sure. you have, is it your, you know, the father of your child? Is that your ex-wife? Uh, she Now, we never got married, but yeah, she's, we're just, uh, we're co-parents. I didn't mean to say father. Why did I say father? Mother of your child. Okay. I don't know why I said father. The mother of your <laughs> I, child, though. I think um, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> is that, is that another, but, is that... but the fact that you have your mo the mother of your child saying, like, the worst parts of you and it really is the dichotomy of the film and that you have her saying that you were a monster basically at points that you were telling your family she's cheating on me uh that you were saying hey i've interrogated terrorists i can get you to admit anything and and really just making her feel horrible and then you have the dichotomy of that with your son who really looks at you as the real life gi joe you could do no wrong to him and right i, I think a lot of guys would say Maybe don't include this in the film. This goes a little bit too far. A lot of guys are open <clears> to <throat> maybe saying, hey, I've done some things wrong. But to have her in the film say the things that she did, I don't know if I would want that said about me, but you felt it'd be too real to not put in there, I assume. Yeah, you know, and honestly, like, when I when Brian contacted me, I was already 1,300 miles into the walk. I was down in Slidell, Louisiana. And he had linked up with me through a mutual friend. We'd all gone to high school together. He was a year ahead of us, and I was a pothead. He was a jock, so that didn't mesh. And that's just kind of how that <laughs> Like goes. you and Ben Morgan, Chris. Hey, uh, me and my buddy Ben. Yeah, straight up Wait, alcoholic no. pothead. I'm I'm the straight and narrow jock. Kind of the straight and narrow. I still drank a little bit. But right, yeah. yeah I, I got you. I got you. Yep. Yeah, yep. but... You know, I, I just realized, I was like, if I'm going to allow this to happen, if I'm going to be a part of this thing, I'm going to be as honest as humanly possible. And I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable with how honest I am. And I'm going to allow all of it to get out there because wh who, what am I going to do if, you know, 10 years down the line, you know, somebody has questions about this and now I'm yeah. finally opening up about it? Like, yeah. no, like, yeah. like, let's shove it all out there, lay myself naked on the altar of humility. This is who I am and this is what I have done. I need help, but I need to also help myself. And I need you to know what I've done because if that can resonate with veterans, that can pull them out of holes. And that's, and that's what I'm yeah. That's and that's that's what we needed to see with yours. I had the same thing with my which we reconciled, we divorced, and then we got back together as the mother of my children with my first son. I, I last year literally was the first year he was 16, 15 last year is the first year we were starting to get to know each other because I, I was gone his whole life. And I was, I, I get that. I, I would come home and I didn't realize it as well. I was, I'd blow up. I'd be angry. I'd be uh, I, I, very, what's the word I'm looking Like you said, I, I could, I'm, I know you're messing around on me. You know, you're, you're very parent, right. not parent, I mean, paranoid to a bit, but you're insecure. So you're untrusting, right. which turns into right. anger. So yeah, that was perfect. That was perfect. Cause guys that have been through that, I got it. I like, yeah, I, I, I feel you, dude. I, I get you. And now I'm trying to make, you know, it, trying to make this reparations with my son that right. saw his angry dad. I, I remember we were, at, we were at Olive Garden. When I saw that scene, it reminded me of him and I and the family sitting at Olive Garden last year. And I'm playing. I have a five-year-old boy that I've been home for. I, I saw yeah. that I've been able. And he, he remember, he looked at me. He goes, how come, how come you never get mad at him, at Colton? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you were always mad at me. You were, you were always mad at me every day that you were home. And that, that honestly, it almost made me cry because he's 15 now. And that's the memories that he has is me always right. being angry. So 
I'm glad you put it in there and it will, it will help. Granted, I, I'm in a good place when I saw, when, when I saw right. that, but if I wasn't, it would, it would help me. It would, it'd be like, right. shit. that's why I put my shit out there too. It's like, Hey man, I try to kill myself. I, I get it. I've been down those holes. I've been out, but you can get out of them. I, right. and I, yeah. And, and, and no, you're spot on. Dude. I'm glad you did. And that's, it's going to resonate. It resonates with guys already knowing like, even like myself that have gone through that and yeah. been like, yeah, okay. You know what? I, it's good not to be the only one and realizing, you know, I can be a pussy a little bit. It's it's okay to be a pussy, but I can still, yeah. I can still nut up and, and do the right thing later. And that's right. I, I love that part of the movie, dude. It was, it was, it was yeah, man. It really hit home. I mean, honestly, dude, and, and I'm proof of it. You're proof of it. You can come back from absolutely yeah. anything. You can yeah. come back from anything. All you got to do is put in the damn wrench time. Yeah. And yep. that's really what it is. And you can't help anybody else until you help yourself. I know those are cliche yep. things, but they're fucking true. They're true. Yep. And, you know, yep. I, I don't. So I'm in a different boat than you are, Chris, because my son doesn't remember any of that. He was okay. way too young. And so his one of his first memories is walking with me into the Fifth Marines War Memorial Gardens. Wow. And so that's really neat. But I'm also very scared because at some point here in the next, you know, five, six years, I'm going to have to let the cat out of the bag and let this kid watch this film. And when he sees it, he's going to realize that, like, man, dad wasn't great when I was young. And that's that's something I'm really struggling with on how to do it and what to do. Um, But it's, you know, it's it's a test that's going to have to come. Yeah. And and I don't see that son's uh, your your child. I don't think he'll look at any more than. Man, my dad's still awesome. I, I really don't see that. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe you'll get on the show again. Like, you know what, Tano, you are totally fucking wrong. You idiot. You're <laughs> fine. But I, I, I don't see that because to me, showing that humility and showing that openness to me, that's a sign of strength where maybe in the past when I was younger, I'd be like I, I'm too man enough. I don't need to talk about that shit. My feelings, my feelings. I don't have feelings. Yeah, right. we do. And, and yeah. Yeah, we absolutely do. And I, that's why I loved it. it. To me, it just shows more strength. It shows me more that I definitely don't want to fuck with this guy. Anybody that can be tough and then show with their feelings, that's a tough motherfucker. That's a tough well, son of a bitch. To me. You know, I, I think honestly, like that, uh, I said this a year ago or two years ago, we were in the film festival circuit and we were doing something. I was on stage uh, and I was like, hey, man, like <laughs> vulnerability is sexy. Like, <laughs> and all these women were like, "Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's all." And your future, and your wife was in. Your current wife was in the oh, audience. Yeah, absolutely was. Panties dropped, didn't they? They just dropped. She sung them. She threw them up on stage, and that was yep. it. Yep, yep. <laughs> and and speaking of, <laughs> he's outside right now. But things went well that <laughs> evening. <laughs> that's awesome. Speaking of the, the film festival that's circuit, hilarious. I mean, I should throw out there that the film did really well. I mean, it won a, a yeah. an award at the Sunscreen Film Festival, the Slam Dance Film <laughs> Festival, and then there's like a dozen others. This thing did amazing. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and you did a ton of media with it, you know, which is great. It's and it's still getting out there doing stuff like this. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was this: the movie is very matter of fact. With look. Uh, a quarter, I believe, of you guys that were out there in Ramadi died, right? And then in addition to that, killed, yeah. yeah, and then in addition to that, you had a ton of guys who committed suicide when they came home. So you you just present it basically as like, this is what happened. These are the guys that we lost. You have the guy with the tattoos of all the names, which is very sobering that it's that many guys. It's like 20 guys on both arms altogether. Um, but the yeah. question I would have for you, and there's no, there's obviously no right or wrong answer to this. And the guys that we have on seem to have very different opinions on this and, and, you know, regardless of their combat experience, but looking back, all the guys that you lost, um, on this deployment in Ramadi and where we are now, you know, pulling out of Afghanistan, I know this is Iraq, but kind of pulling out of the Middle East as a whole and, and ending <laughs> these, these wars at this point, all these, you know, 20 years later, do, do you think this sacrifice was worth it? Should we have been there in the first place? Was it worth losing, you know, 20 of your friends? Well, it, well, so the total number is 34, which is, you know, wow. it's, it's 33 Marines and one Navy service corpsman. Um, wow. And I, I've had that question a few times. I actually had that question on CNN back in 2017, and I immediately said no. And uh, I still believe that it's no. Uh, and, and the reason is, is because regardless of what we were meant to do over there, regardless of what the job is, men stood side by side and protected each other. 
Men stood side by side and said, I'm not, I'm not going to let anything fucking happen to you. And we fought our hearts out. And I am damn proud of every single one of those men that didn't get to come home. Uh, and their sacrifice is not for naught. Their sacrifice gave me the ability to come home because that man said, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to protect you and I'll die for you if necessary. And 34 of them died for us to come home. And yeah. that is how it will always be, man. And anyone that, you know, I know I've struggled with it too, with the idea of like, oh, did we ever actually do anything good? But honestly, when you see the amount of inhumanity in yeah. war uh, and then you see glimmers of humanity in war, it makes it all worth it. It makes it all, it, you understand it because you see it as I've now protected a people and I've protected maybe, maybe that little girl gets to go to college or maybe that little girl like isn't going to get punished by some fucking horrible regime. You know, maybe that'll happen and maybe I helped her. And that's, that's what I sit on. Yeah, that's a good, good way to look at it. I, I think if any of us look at it from a political standpoint, we always will say, fuck that now. But I, you don't get That's not why we did it. That's not why I didn't go up there because the president told me to. I would say this is this felt like the right thing to do. And then like just like you said, just we're there with our buddies. We And at that time, I I, know I enjoyed I did it it's good and bad. I can look at him and I really I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. And I'm glad I was with these guys that I sure with. I, I'm, I, so I, I agree. I, I, I don't think there's anything you can say where you're going to uh, was it worth it? Well, that's a that's a that's getting into political bullshit. So and nothing is yeah, ever worth politics. Question. Yeah, but as far as doing it and me needing to be there, wanting to be there, yeah. you go back to Full Metal Jacket with the guy cowboy. Well, I don't know if I if America needs to be here, but I do, and and that's that, that's what it comes down to. I I want to be here, so right. I don't give a two shits what the sec, sec def says or what. The president. I, this is where I want to be, and I want to be right here with him, and I want to be right here with him, with right here with her, and I want to protect and uh, each other. And yeah, I, so I, I agree. That's that's a tough question. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, Ian, that not knocking that court. That's a great question, but yeah. again, it comes down to I don't think any of us, at least I don't know. Maybe I, I don't want to speak. I don't want to speak for you, Jonathan. But look at that bigger picture of I'm here serving my country i'm the biggest patriot in the world and we're going to bring democracy anywhere nobody that served really has that mindset because they know they don't say fuck it doesn't fuck it when you get on the ground it doesn't work that way right right absolutely not <laughs> we're i'm i'm never going to get into the political side of it i'll never do it because there's no reason uh for me to ever allow politicians to be inside our lives and to ever be able to talk about our lives as if they know anything. So I don't give them, I don't give them the time of day. Uh, and I don't, I don't listen to them. I don't want to listen to them. I don't care. And use, use my experience getting into it for three years as an example of the wrong thing to do. Right. I, granted, we needed to say what we needed to say, but then oh, getting absolutely. in the political, political realm, it did nothing but make things worse internally. I, you hung out with Tig. I love Tig. Tig still right. like, dude, come <laughs> yeah. on, man, you back away from it. You're an awesome dude. Back off of that stuff. Right. So right. You can get your head right. Cause all it does is just piss you off. Cause you're That's never going to, you're never going to win a political battle with, with political douchebags and, and why. And I like your mind. You're not worth my time, dude. And that's how I know. You're not worth my fucking time. I, I, yep. I, I, but and that's it. Yeah. That's all uh, it is. I, and I've tried to show that to other people who get pissed off and live on Facebook. And I'm like, guys, don't do that. <laughs> don't do like, that. Don't, don't live on Facebook and keep screaming about other like <laughs> you're yelling into a bucket, man. This is an echo chamber. Like you're not nobody's listening to you. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. And Ian and I preach that on the show all the time. It's like, get off, do your if you got to post, post, but get the fuck off social media. Get that's why I got off Twitter. Twitter is the worst. They're like, oh. I ain't gonna be on that hateful. Uh, no, but that's just celebrity telling you you're an asshole. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, man, um, I, I know I, I, well, I got, I, you know, talking in the end here, um, coming up, uh, and I appreciate you staying on a long time with us, John. Yeah, brother, absolutely. We really, you know, we got in the movie when it was done, and you know, me and, and honestly, I, I just from my experience of being in and seeing when it's done, and then going and seeing the final product where you're by yourself. Is that what you? Did? I'm sure is that what you did. You kind of went by yourself, or did you see it at the festival? That was like uh, the, the. Or did you have a private screening just for you, so you could say, 
Yeah, or no, nah, was no. Nah. So I'm I'm in a weird position. I'm considered the consulting producer on this thing, right? Okay. And so I've had I've had a million iterations of the film, uh, and so I've I've seen it from you know the four and a half hour Schneider cut to uh to the to the hour and thirty minutes that it ends up being. Right. Uh, but when I saw it at Santa Barbara International Film Festival when we okay. premiered there, um, that was the first time I saw it with a crowd and. That crowd was nothing but civilians. There might have been one or two military guys in there, but it wasn't much because Santa Barbara isn't a military town. And so, you know, I mean, it's, these are that's rich retired town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's nineteen million dollar boats sitting out there, and you're like, all right. <laughs> so this ought to be interesting. And we we screened the first day with a in a hundred and hundred fifty person theater. There might have been a hundred and twelve, hundred and fifteen people in there. It wasn't packed, but it wasn't empty. And no one left at that one, and then we had a Q&A, and then these two massive reviews came out that evening, uh, just spinning around inside the film festival circuit, and they switched our venue to the Libero Theater, which is like a 700-person theater the next day. Oh, that's awesome. I, I showed up an hour later, or an hour before, and there's a line around the corner, and I'm like, holy wow. shit, we got a mom? Right. And... Uh, and so I, at the end of that one, I sat up and, and I, I did a Q&A and the amount of civilian engagement uh, of real questions, not how many yeah. people can kill or any of that bullshit, yeah. but like real questions of like, okay, I've seen this. How do I help now? And these are very pointed questions about what do I do now? Because you're obviously, we're going to consider you the subject matter expert on this and we're, we want you to tell us what to do. And I'm like, oh, this is this just got really interesting, but it became a bridge to the civilian world, right? Where they had no understanding of what veterans go through on, when they come home. They have no understanding of, you know, what combat looks like. And then to be given a very intimate portrayal of it, uh, they fell in love with it. And everyone that has seen it just falls in love with it and just starts acting and reacting and starting to be proactive in doing things. I met, there was a lady there that uh, right after that screening, she left, she found a veteran nonprofit in the area and she volunteered with them and she still volunteers with them to this day. And she goes, Bastards Road changed my life and I want to help veterans. And that that's all I want. I want that bridge to happen so that we can finally create this homogenous idea of what right. America is, veteran and civilian together, and really just experience those experiences together. And for the for the civilians to listen without that judgmental ear, because a lot of the reason that a lot of us don't open up is fear of judgment, because you're not going to understand yeah. what we went through. And when I tell you I killed a kid, you're going to fucking go call the cops or something. And, you know, I don't I don't need that in my life. Uh, so it's nice to see that this movie is doing exactly what I hoped it would do. That's awesome, man. That, God, that's that, beautiful, man. And that's the that's same true. thing I think we try to do with this because our audience is probably about half civilian and half uh, veteran. And I do think <clears> it's all about bridging that gap and, uh, you know, finding a way to connect with each other. Um, the last thing I'm wondering, actually, and I was just curious about, I mean, it's been a couple of years since the film was shot, of course. And there's so many guys who lost their lives at their own hands that you talk about in the film. And Every guy that you show in the film has a different personality. Uh, you can really tell. Some of the guys seem much older than they actually are. Some of them seem like a guy I would hang out with. Um, but is everybody still alive and, and doing well that we see in that film? Everybody in the, everybody in the film is still alive and doing well. Uh, absolutely every single person in that film is. And uh, uh, Mac uh, is one of my uh, greatest buddies. We went through boot camp all the way to combat together, which is fucking unheard of in the Marine Corps. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Yeah, that, that's all. So we, yeah, we were in platoon <clears throat> 269 together, then we were in SOI, then we were in 2-4, and then we're in Ramadi together. And uh, Mac, had a, Mac had a tough run of it. And, you know, a lot of us did. And I talked to Mac uh, every day, every damn day. And, uh, we, he's doing much better. He, he got out of a really shitty relationship. He moved to Michigan. He bought a home. Uh, he's actually down in Lejeune, uh, right now with a couple other two, four brothers because, uh, he's now a Sergeant major, but Sergeant major bomb, uh, is now the Sergeant major for, I think it's second MSOB. Uh, so he's support battalion for Marsoc. And so he was doing the change command this morning. So I got on the internet this morning, saw him like, Instagram or something, you know, there's like nine, two, four bastards just sitting there. And I'm like, that's fucking awesome. So <laughs> yes. you know, we, we, we all continue to like get together, but everyone in that film is absolutely doing better than they were when they gave those interviews. 
That's all. I, I, you know, saying that it, it, where he got out of a bad relationship, um, I think a lot of the guys, when they're ha- going through bad issues, they forget, they, they think it's the war. They think it's what we did. They think the things that, and they forget to look at who's this partner right next to you. I, I would, I would put dollars to donuts 90% of the time you're with a person that you shouldn't be with. And that was my issues when I had, when I was divorced and was dating just a crazy, crazy woman. And I thought it was, I'm just going as whole as this shit I've been through. It wasn't, it was, I didn't have a good support network right next to you. Right. When you do find that good woman or partner, or whatever it is you want with you, and that's actually supports you and is not trying to rip you down or, right. or trying to use whatever you have to, for their advantage. That's when guys get better. I, and I said, you're in a good relationship now. I, I think it, you can tell. And if you were in oh, a bad yeah. relationship, I think we could obviously tell as well. And so oh, guys, yeah, guys got to look. Guys, guys got to look at who they're surrounding themselves with. Not just your brothers and your friends, but that partner. My wife has helped me immensely because she is supportive. She doesn't tell me what I need to hear. She, right. I mean, she doesn't tell me what I want to hear. She tells me what right. I need to hear, but she's extremely supportive. So, I don't. Know, my last question is: Is that man? We, we forget about the relationships, the, the right. actual relationships, and that is the hugest part of us getting out of our funk and bad relationships were. Guys end up taking their own lives, and it, right. nine times out, it's because they're in a because they're dating not nothing against strippers, but because they're dating a stripper from, you know, I, you know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't mean I'm not trying to knock you stripper. There's I'm sure they're, you're oh. wonderful. I, you know, yeah, what I'm saying? I you, single moms, you know, no worries. But <laughs> <laughs> oh but man, it's yeah, and you're not wrong. And you know, I I'd gone through a, a, a string of bad relationships where, uh, and and maybe I wasn't mature enough yet, or maybe I hadn't done enough self reflection yet. Uh, to really understand what I needed or what I wanted or w- even what I deserved. And, and I think that was huge too, is that there's two things you're ve- as, as a veteran of the military service, there are two things you are absolutely deserving of. You're deserving of love and you are deserving of peace, but you have to fight for both of those things and you have to figure it out. And the shitty part of that is that you have to go down some of these shit roads on these shit relationships to understand you don't want that or don't need yeah. that. And, yeah. you know, fortunately, my wife, uh, she I think she wears the pants in this relationship. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure she beats the shit out of me, like not physically, but man. Well, I, well, I can tell by the way your house is decorated. It's obviously not you that's decorating the house because that place looks pretty, pretty kept, dude. Uh, that looks yeah, pretty awesome. It's pretty nice. Uh, so it's, <laughs> oh, there is so some Marine Corps awesome. memorabilia. I'm sure that's the, you know. Oh that's yeah, I mean, we got the we got the whole "I love me" wall over there. Oh yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I know you're all dressed right, wall. dressed, but you're not dressed right, dressed once you get out, dude. That's your wife. No, that's not. No, that's not. It's, it's, it's totally the wife because I'm over here like <laughs> we can do this just like Tuesday, and she's like, you're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking true. I, I, I it always, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because it, it is, guys. Man, man, when you're in a serious relationship, it, it, that's when you go down those bad roads. And we think it's something else. And it's not. It's, God, stop surrounding yourself with shit. And find right. somebody. Yeah, and, and right. And once we do. Yeah. And understand your worth and know that you are worth it in so many ways. And yeah. that's, that's well the said. key, is that you are worth it, but you have to fight for it. Well said, man. That was yeah. well said. I, I appreciate it. This has fucking been awesome, man. Uh, it really man, happens. And- so, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on, man. And you know what? I didn't expect this to necessarily be a fun interview because, as I said, it's a dark movie. So I'm so thankful that Chris asked that question because I was, I truly was laughing hysterically, as you guys can hear. I mean, that <laughs> is an amazing story. And it makes me look forward to the book. Um, yeah, 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 the documentary me. is Bastards Road, bastardsroad.com. And we should say, we didn't even say it during the interview, but the reason for the title is that you guys, the two former Marines, were known as the Magnificent yeah. Bastards. That's where the title comes right. from. Um, but it's streaming on various platforms. And, uh, yeah, you could follow the movie itself on Instagram at Bastards Road Movie. And then you could follow Jonathan on Instagram at the number one Magnificent Bastard on Instagram. One Magnificent Bastard. Great name. Yeah. Um, any Anything else before uh, we wrap this up? Yeah, I mean, if you're interested, uh, the nonprofit's called BastardsRoadProject.org. Okay. Find it there. And then um, on Instagram, it's Bastards Road Project. But uh, we're opening up. So we're working all the kinks out. I got another group of veterans I'm taking to Zion here uh, in early August for a couple days. Dude, I've, I've always wanted to go there. Zion National Park. That looks amazing. Oh, buddy. it's are you, are that, That's beautiful, man. Oh, man. That's yeah, going to be world, man. 
Wow. How, how far are you from there? Are, are you, well, I'm in, I'm in Phoenix, so it's- Oh, you're not far from, yeah. Seven hours. Yeah, it's, um, it's just to, I, I went to school, I played football at Dixie Junior College when it was at St. George, so. Yeah, yeah. I used, yeah, I used to go run. That's where I got around all the, you know, I grew up around the Mormons, so I, I know. Right. All that. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, I used to run in Zion Park, and I would run in Bryce Canyon up the road, too, and that's beautiful. It's, man, yeah, they're going to have a blast. Oh, they're, yeah, they're, wow. they, don't, they have no idea what they're in for yet. I'm going to take them up Angel, Angel's Landing and get crazy. Wow. Wow, but, uh, but next year, uh, in, into the new year, we're going to open this up to outside of Arizona veterans. I'm working the kinks out of my nonprofit, just making sure I understand all the logistics <laughs> yeah. and getting all these partnerships together and really doing it the right way. So I'm grassrootsing it. Uh, but I'm going to open it up to veterans across the uh, across the nation starting next year. And we'll do some hikes out of Arizona, uh, something on the PCT, a couple things on the AT, hopefully. Uh, we'll get this thing rocking and rolling and really start getting some veterans into some long distance hikes in some of the most gorgeous places they fought for. Fantastic, awesome, man. Yeah. I, and yeah. with all these this hiking, how much weight have you lost from the height of, you know, the 300s? So I'm I hum in right around 220 right now. And that's my nice. happy weight. Uh, nice. but that's great. Uh, so I went from, th when I started the walk, I went from 308 to 198 on that 10 month period where I rode wow. a mountain bike. And that's then incredible. I got on the walk. Yeah. I got on the walk <laughs> and I actually ended the walk at 204 pounds. Uh, I gained weight on this walk because, and I, I attribute that to the Midwest, uh, because I was, <laughs> uh, first off, I was eating, uh, I was everything. eating about a, Oh, buddy, I was eating. I was eating Rocky Mountain oysters on the daily. Those are so good. Oh man, when they're fried just right and they and they smash those balls down to. Yeah, it was flat, like, like isn't that actual chips, like dude. bison's balls? Yeah, oh, it's it's right, it's, 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 it's bulls balls, but yeah, they, bull balls. man, if you got somebody that can mat, really, you don't have to. They're not a ball. If you get them like a ball, they're they're a little bit too meaty. You got a little too meaty. <laughs> a little yeah. bit of balls in your mouth. You realize you realize what you're actually doing if you have an actual <laughs> spherical thing you're starting to put in your mouth. You're like, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. Yeah. So they mash them down. So it's like a it's like a deep fried chip with some meat. Yeah. It's like a chip with meat in the middle. Just they're awesome. Just don't yeah. think of it as I'm eating balls. I mean, no, they're they're really good. And then on top of that, uh, because the Midwest has you know less populated areas. Yeah. The longer I would walk, I would carry a uh, tub of butter flavored Crisco, and then I would carry uh, I would carry a package of brown sugar, and then a flat of tortillas, and I so I would smear the fat all over the tortilla, put some brown sugar on it, roll it up. And I'd call them my fat roll ups, and then I would just chow down on <laughs> it's fucking horrible for you, but I swear to you, it is rocket fuel. Oh wow! Yeah, and you, you need it. You're burning a hell of a For lot sure. of calories, dude. Dude, I, I did the I did the math one day. I was burning I was burning thirty five to forty eight hundred calories wow. a day. How 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 heavy was the tick? How heavy was your ruck yeah, you had on it? It, it uh, if I'm in if I'm in a place where I'm good on water and I've got lots of access to water points, I'm holding in at about seventy pounds. If uh, 68, 70 pounds. If I'm in high desert and I'm water dry, uh, I'm holding at about <clears> eight. Or 85 pounds. Yeah, you're, you're burning. People don't realize how that thing's a heater on your back. Oh, that's all it is. And yeah, that's why dead of the winter, like when we go work out, and do, I, I couldn't wait, even though I hated it, I couldn't wait to get that thing on my back to, to warm right. up. Warm yeah. me up. <laughs> yeah. But, but then during the summer, oh. yeah, that thing sucked. You're, 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 you're just bleeding calories and water. I, yeah. No, I, I would, that sounds good. I'm going to go try one of those. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's right. I'm, nice. I'm never going to eat it again. <laughs> I, see Crisco and I see butter play for oh. Crisco in the damn thing, and I'm like, mm -mm, I'm mm -hmm. not touching that. Brand, uh, brown, I'll just Crazy put butter, brand. get some country, country crock and brown right. sugar. Yeah, we'll get some of that out here. Yeah, man. Uh, awesome, man. Um, yeah, I, I, I know Chris has to get going, so we're going to leave it at that. Um, The last thing I'll say for the audience is the end of uh, – well, actually, just in a few weeks, really. We're going to do a two-part Q&A, so get your questions into us. Battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. Send them in. Um, Yeah, just email any good questions to us. Battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. We'll answer them. And uh, you also have your 14th Hour Foundation event coming up at the uh, end of this month. If people want to get uh, in on that, yeah. they still can, right? I, I think so. I think there's still some tables left. I, it's been it's pretty packed. Um, but I, you can check with the Shadow Warrior Riders, and and that's out in Orlando. And like I said, the foundation we started at grassroots. We we everything is just straight up little donations, little donations, and it's just it's just grown. But you know, speaking of that, Jonathan, we we help other foundations. So 
we help guys if, if a foundation needs somebody to fly money to fly uh, somebody will just apply and just show me yeah, 51 c3 and we'll 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 give you money dude that's no cool. worries and uh i already talked to christy so you've got a couple gifts coming your way for that oh uh, awesome so I, thanks I, man I signed, uh, I think I signed five different DVDs for you. Did you really? I didn't yeah, see my I, wife handles all that. So obviously, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I appreciate that. Brother. No worries. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so You're much. And, and we got to say thank you to Jeremy Mitchell for uh, for introducing us and making the connection. Thank you, Jeremy. This has been great. If it wasn't yeah. for him, we wouldn't have had this interview. Yeah, no joke. Absolutely. The, the dude, don't don't let that don't let that country South Alabama draw. He's, he's crack. He's smarter than a whip, dude. He's I know he, is. he just he, but he still can't spell for shit. So no, I will agree with not that. spell. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, brother. Facebook post and I'm like, oh, buddy, we need a dictionary. I was like, dude, I, I always said, this, will you make sure to have Lisa? Lisa's his wife. I said, Lisa spell checks everything. Spell check. That's his call sign. His call sign is spell check. Yeah. It's like make sure Lisa is spell checking everything. I know Chris. I know shit. Oh, I just, but the, the dude is. I mean, the dude can do fucking probability, statistics, and trigonometry and everything in his head. Yeah, he just can't spell. He can do it all at one time. And like, oh my right. gosh, the most brilliant, smart, dumb guy I've ever met. That's yeah, I know. I love him to death. Yeah, yeah. No, he's thank he's a great guy. Me. So thank I'll, you, Jeremy. And, uh, and yeah, thank you, John, for coming on, man. We really appreciate yeah. it. And, and it's been, you know, like I said, I wasn't expecting it to be fun, but it was fun. And, and that was one of the best stories I've heard on this show. Yeah, yeah. brother. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, brother. Take care. Jonathan, right. you, need, you need anything, reach out to Jeremy. He, he'll, he'll pass on stuff to me. Jeremy, sure. Jeremy takes care of me. He's, he's my boy. He's, he's awesome. Too easy, Too easy All right, brother. brother. That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast, but we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never quit. <laughs>